Hi everyone and welcome to our Thursday TNT, the 29th of June. Can you believe we're nearly at the end of June? Uh, now we're nearly at the end of June. The election was back on May the 14th and we're still not much closer to getting a new Prime Minister or Parliament. Now speaking of which, I'll be speaking about all the political stories at the end of today's program. So uh, for those people that say, oh, we don't want to hear all the politics stuff. Well, you don't have to. You can get to the end of the program. That's where we'll do all the politics today. And you can just switch off and go and watch something else. But uh, we'll start with this story, which isn't so much political, but it does have a political edge to it. And the story reported by Reuters, Thai protesters acquitted over run-in with Queen's motorcade. Now, this photo actually says quite a lot, and you can see a lot of protesters there, and uh, the yellow Rolls-Royce with Her Majesty the Queen inside. Now, the, the, the location of these protests was known days before, well, at least on the morning of the protest, and for some reason, the, uh, they decided to drag Her Majesty the Queen through an area where there were active protests. I mean... You really think that somebody either made a ridiculous mistake or were trying to stir up trouble. Now, another thing you can see in this photo is that the protesters are all, almost unanimously, using that three-finger salute, made popular in the Hunger Games, but has also become popular with protesters as a, a sort of a signature of democracy. But uh, we move on with the story, and it says that a Thai court yesterday acquitted five anti-government protesters indicted on charges of attempted violence against the country's Queen during a demonstration in 2020. And the case stemmed from an event at the height of pro-democracy demonstrations in 2020, in which a motorcade carrying Queen Sotida was heckled as it drove past a group of protesters. The youth-led demonstrations had also called for royal reform, including amending the controversial Les Majeste law, which punishes each perceived royal insult with up to 15 years in prison. And the monarchy, which many ties consider sacrosanct, is officially above politics and constitutionally enshrined to be held in revered worship. Now, about that, a lot of the commentary from the protesters at the time in a list of demands was to include or enshrine the, uh, the head of state in the constitution and actually codify the role of the head of state. So they weren't talking about getting rid of the head of state or uh, abolishing the monarchy or anything. They were just talking about including and enshrining the role of the head of state in the constitution. A lot of uh, th their demands were misread by royalists who thought they were just trying to abolish the monarchy. But that was never the case. The Thai lawyers for human rights said the court saw that police did not clear the way for the royal motorcade. There was no announcement before the procession. And then witness testimony was different and even police in the area did not know there would be a royal motorcade passing through. Now, I've been in Thailand long enough uh, and seen enough of these royal motorcades to know that police go out of their way to clear the way, to clear the traffic, and it takes hours to prepare for this. Now, just recently out on Tepkasat 3 Road in Phuket, we had His Majesty uh, arriving for the opening of a new provincial office. But that went on for days, the preparations for that motorcade. Now, as it happened, people there patiently waiting, they bust in hundreds of people just out the front of where I live. And uh, the motorcade went past, I estimate at over 100 kilometers an hour, but anyway, that's what happens with these motorcades. They are well communicated and well organised. So I don't really believe what the police are saying there. Let's see how it's been reported in other parts of the world. CNN reporting they faced life in prison for blocking the Queen's motorcade, but these Thai protesters just got acquitted. And then from the BBC.com, Thai court acquits five charged with blocking Queen's convoy. And from Channel News Asia, Thai protesters acquitted over run-in with Queen's motorcade. Well, in the end, it looks like common sense has prevailed and those uh, five protesters have had to wait 
for two and a half years to find out if they were going to be thrown in jail. Moving on, I oh, just wanted to remind you again that we're putting all the politics at the end of the program today. Moving on to our next story, and this reported by BangkokPost.com. Fewer Chinese tourists to upset Thailand's recovery goal. Chinese uneven GDP growth detrimental to outbound tourism. So it's not just Thailand that's probably suffering a lack of Chinese tourists at the moment. It's other places in the world. Let's see what the article says. Thailand's likely to miss its goal of hosting 30 million foreign tourists amid fewer than expected visitors from China. And inbound arrivals from China to Thailand could drop slightly below 5 million, way below the 7 million expected by the government. And this from a spokesperson from the RHB Bank. The possibility of China's economic activity slowing in the second, should be second half of this year, will crimp demand for outbound tourism. And he says, we expect full year tourism arrivals to disappoint official estimates. Thailand's tourism prognosis remains at best neutral, given the recent slowdown in inbound tourism momentum. Well, that's certainly the case. Things have really slowed down, Uh, particularly on this tourism island. I've noticed things are really, really quiet, a lot quieter than we'd expect during the low season. Uh, And it's much the same in other sort of tourism hotspots around the country. Uh, But none of this has uh, stopped the TAT from touting the amazing tourism recovery here in Thailand. NationThailand.com reporting that 1 in 10 travellers to Thailand now from China. New figures from SiteMinder, Maituan and the Tourism Authority of Thailand reveal that over 1.3 million of the 11 million plus international travellers to Thailand this year arrived from China. Just remembering that back in 2019, the last full year of tourism before the COVID pandemic, it was nearly 25% of arrivals, international arrivals, were from China, up or down a few percent depending on where you were in the country. 25%. And now they're lauding that uh, 10% of tourists are coming from China. Yay! These latest findings follow TAT's projection that international arrivals to Thailand will reach 25 million this year. No, their latest projection was that it was 30 million. So it looks like they're changing their own statistics, which is more than double the number of arrivals in 2022. And data from SiteMinder found that weekly reservations made by Chinese travellers to SiteMinder's Thai hotel customers have increased by 79% since the start of the year. Remembering that these days the vast majority of Chinese travellers are these FITs, the free and independent travellers, and they are making their own reservations on, well, the Chinese versions of things like Bookings.com and Agoda. Since the start of the year, the weekly volume of bookings made by Chinese travellers to our hotel customers has grown by 79% in Thailand and 58% globally. So a lot of enthusiasm there by SiteMinder and the TAT. I dare say that that would have been originally a media release from SiteMinder. You're watching TNT, not TAT, and it's Thursday. We appreciate you watching. And a big thanks to Five Star Marine, an ongoing supporter of the program. If you'd like to go out on a VIP charter tour off the island of Phuket to any of the islands around Pang Na Bay, I can warmly recommend Five Star Marine. There's a deal down below in the description. So the next big question, if you are coming to Thailand, is how far will your money go? And there's certainly been a bit of fluctuation in the currency market regarding the Thai baht recently. I thought I'd have a look at a few charts and see if we can make any sense of this. Firstly, oh, by the way, these are all from xe.com. And uh, these were a screenshot around about 7.30 a.m. Thai time today. And we go to this chart. This is uh, showing the last year of trading for the U.S. dollar. Currently today at 35.6 Thai baht to the U.S. dollar. And you can see that it peaked at just over 38 Thai baht to the dollar back in October last year and resting at 35.6 Thai baht to the dollar today. Now this is the British pound to the Thai baht and out of the uh, currencies we're looking at today, this uh, the, the, the British pound is doing better than most other currencies against the Thai baht. And it shows that today it's nearly 45 Thai baht to the pound 
and currently that's the highest it's been over the past year. And checking the Australian dollar, currently at about 23.5 Thai baht to the Australian dollar, and it's sort of bumping up and down the bottom there, but you can see back in July last year, it peaked at nearly 25.6 Thai baht over the last year. And this is the euro, and like the British pound, the euro is also doing very well against the Thai baht. Currently 38.8 Thai baht to the euro, and that's the highest it's been over the past 12 months. And then checking with the Indian rupee, and it's important to measure this one because, of course, the travellers from India are some of the most numerous to Thailand over the past 12 months. And it peaked last year around October at around 0.46 Thai baht to the rupee, and currently it's around about 0.43. So uh, it's on its way back up, but uh, nowhere near its peak. So I thought that might be of interest, checking out some of the charts, and they were all screenshot from xe.com. Checking our next story today, and this is from coconuts.co, their Bangkok edition, Fallen Buddha Crushes Sisaket Man to Death. And a sad story indeed. A man was crushed to death yesterday by a large Buddha statue. He was delivering to a monk's funeral. And police are investigating the site in Sisaket, which is right out near the uh, east border of Thailand with Cambodia, after two workers were crushed, one fatally, by the 200 kilogram statue meant for a royal cremation ceremony for a revered local monk. And down the bottom there, the plan had been to move the Buddha from the temple's front pavilion to the interior of the sermon hall. And as they were unloading the truck, it fell from the truck onto one of the men. They immediately rushed to lift the statue from him, but it was already unresponsive. So wishing the, uh, the other injured party there uh, well as he recovers from uh, his injury. Sadly, one person died. Moving on to Bangkok, and this story reported by the thepatianews.com, and it says karaoke raided in Bangkok for alleged child sex exploitation. The raid at the Tukta karaoke in Bang Mod happened at midnight yesterday, came after officers from the Department of Provincial Administration were notified of the situation by the International Anti-Trafficking Network. And the karaoke was initially found with no licence, and they had 13 female staffers who were found servicing customers, obviously helping them with more than the lyrics to their songs. The karaoke owner is being accused of child sexual exploitation, operating an entertainment venue without a permit and allowing children to do inappropriate behaviour. And two victims, both minors aged 16 and 17, were rescued and taken to the National Referral Mechanism for mental recovery and health examinations. I think a lot of the terminology there ha has sort of been lost in translation, but we get the idea and uh, good to see that karaoke establishment raided in Bangkok. Moving on to another story today from nationthailand.com and BMA relaxes hairstyle uniform rules at schools under its jurisdiction. And as a first step towards freedom and respecting child's rights, the BMA has instructed 437 schools to let their students wear casual clothes once a week. Now, just as a bit of background, Thai schools, for as long as I can remember, have had very strict codes in regards to their uniform and also the length of the hair and the way that they dress. Looks like in Bangkok, at least, they're looking to start relaxing these. The BMA has also instructed schools to ease off on regulations related to students' hairstyles and insisted that everybody's styles and preferences be respected. One order said that students at all BMA schools should be allowed one non-uniform day a week. The schools can reach an agreement with the students and their parents on which day this would be. The order said students who find it difficult to wear casual clothing can opt for their physical education or scout guide uniforms. So at least a partial win there for some of the uh, protesting students who have been pushing for changes to the uniform and hairstyle rules for many years here in Thailand. That is the end of most of our general news. We're now moving into the political news. For those of you that hate the politics, you can now turn off. And I thank you for watching up to now. 
But uh, for the rest of you, let's move on to today's political stories. We start with BangkokPost.com, and this was published during the afternoon yesterday, and we've got some updates coming up. Move Forward postpones House Speaker meeting with Per Thai. So there were going to be some big meetings today between the eight coalition parties who are, well, intending to form a new government. Per Thai looks like they've pulled out of them. Let's see what's happened. The Move Forward Party postponed indefinitely its planned meeting yesterday with the Per Thai Party after its coalition ally again demanded the position of House Speaker. And today's planned meeting of all eight coalition parties was also postponed. A Move Forward Party spokeswoman informed reporters of the indefinite delay on Tuesday night. The two major players in the eight-party coalition had earlier planned to reach agreement on the House Speaker seat at a meeting yesterday. With Per Thai standing firm on having the House Speaker's seat, Move Forward Party has named a Pitsanolok MP as its candidate for the job. And the Per Thai leader Cholnan said yesterday that his party insisted on having the Speaker's seat and it had informed Move Forward Party of this from the very beginning. Move Forward Party had not made any direct response to Per Thai on the matter. And the uh, Per Thai leader confirmed that Per Thai still intended to be part of the next government with its seven allies and Move Forward Party leader Peter Lim Jolanrat as Prime Minister. And also from the Bangkok Post, and uh, this came from BangkokPost.com this morning, new twist on the Speaker Rao. And it says that the Move Forward Party and Per Thai may consider a new power sharing proposal when they hold talks today to negotiate over the role of House Speaker. The main thing here is, of course, that they're still speaking. They're still negotiating. One possibility is that Per Thai will give up one cabinet seat in exchange for the House Speakership, meaning the party will take 13 cabinet posts and the House Speaker role, while the MFP will get 15 cabinet seats and the Prime Minister's position. Under Per Thai's original proposal, the two parties would be allocated 14 cabinet seats each, with the Move Forward Party entitled to the PM's position and Per Thai taking the House Speaker role. And the new terms are expected to be raised to end the stalemate over the House Speaker post as Parliament's set to convene next week. However, reports emerged yesterday that both parties will meet today and expect to iron out their differences. The House of Representatives will convene on July the 4th to select a Speaker and two deputies. After His Majesty the King presides over the state opening of Parliament on July the 3rd. And Sreta Tarvisin, a prime ministerial candidate for the Per Thai Party, said yesterday that no matter how the matter is resolved, the political partnership between the two parties would carry on. It certainly looks like Sreta has become one of the main spokespersons for the Per Thai Party. Taxan, Taxan Shinawat's youngest daughter, Patongtan, who's recently become a mum, she's just sort of floated back into the background in recent weeks. Then again, she's got plenty on her hands, just being a mum. And also from BangkokPost.com, Peter won't get five votes for PM, according to a senator. And Peter Lim Jorunrat, the leader and prime ministerial candidate of the Move Forward Party, will likely receive fewer than five votes from the Senate in the parliamentary election for the new prime minister. This is according to one senator. He says the dust has already settled and Mr Peter will be hard pushed to draw five or more votes from the 250 senators during the vote. And he says that most of the coup appointed senators seem to have decided they will either vote against Mr Peter or abstain. Cowards. And the senator said he suspects Mr Peter will not be the only candidate entering the race. The vote's expected on July the 13th. Any party that's won 25 House seats or more can nominate up to three candidates. And Mr Kittisak said, I'm on the side of democracy with the king as head of state. So says the man who was hand-picked for the job, uh, no election, by General Prayut Chanochar after the new constitution in 2017. And the MFPs vowed to press for amendments to Section 12 of the Criminal Code, or the Les Majeste Law. This is believed to be the prime reason why many senators will not back Mr Peter in his bid to become Prime Minister.
So those meetings continue today between Per Thai and the Move Forward Party. Looks like Mr Peter still has a battle on his hands with those senators still being quite hostile to his nomination as Prime Minister. That's it for today. Thank you for joining us, especially if you got to the end of the program. Please subscribe to the channel if you get an opportunity. Big thanks to our sponsor, Five Star Marine. And of course, a big thanks to you for, for dropping in. We'll see you tomorrow.